Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Testing Psychologist podcast, the podcast where we talk all about the business and practice of psychological and neuropsychological assessment. I'm your host, Dr. Jeremy Sharp, licensed psychologist, group practice owner, and private practice coach. This podcast is brought to you by PAR. Conduct a broad-based assessment of personality and psychopathology with the gold standard Personality Assessment Inventory, or PAI. The new PAI Spanish revised translation retains semantic equivalence while using clearer and more inclusive language. Learn more at PARINC.com backslash PAI. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Testing Psychologist podcast. My guests today are quite a team. I've got Dr. Joni Lakin and Anna Hausman talking to me all about the COGAT. The COGAT, as some of you may know, is an ability test primarily administered in schools and used for GT assessment. So we're going to dig into many aspects of the COGAT, but really focus on strengths-based applications and how to use the COGAT in schools outside of the typical uh, domain of GT assessment. So we get into basics and background of the COGAT, what it is, how it was developed, how it compares to IQ tests, and so forth. We talk about strengths-based applications, of course, and how we can use COGAT data to uh, identify and perhaps close the ability achievement gap. Uh, we take a little detour into spatial reasoning and how it is an under underappreciated skill and many other topics. So uh, this is a good one. And whether you're familiar with the COGAT or not, I think there's a lot to take away. So let me tell you about my guests. Dr. Joni Lakin is a professor at the University of Alabama and as co-author of the Cognitive Abilities Test, or COGAT, Form 8. She studies educational measurement issues related to test validity and fairness with a particular interest in the accessibility of tests for English learner students. She also studies science, technology, engineering, and math education and interventions that promote STEM retention along the academic journey. Anna Hausman is the product marketing director at Riverside Insights. Before Riverside, Anna taught elementary and middle school and served as a district assessment director. So as you can tell, they come at this topic from two very important perspectives and the symbiosis of their opinions, I think, is evident during our discussion. Lots to take away from this one. If you're a practice owner and you're looking for some group coaching and accountability and support and connection with other practice owners who are running testing practices, I would invite you to check out the Testing Psychologist Mastermind Groups. There's a group for every level of practice development, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. And you can get more info and schedule a pre-group call at thetestingpsychologist.com slash consulting. All right, let's get to my conversation with Anna Hausman and Dr. Jody, Joni Lakin. Joni, Anna, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Jeremy. We're excited to be here. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to talk with you. Uh, let's do just a little uh, orientation for the listeners, which is pretty common when I have multiple guests. Um, Joni, could you just talk a little bit and give a super brief background so people can start to identify your voice? And then, Anna, you can do the same thing after that. Yeah, uh, so I'm Dr. Joni Lakin. I'm a professor at the University of Alabama, uh, and I have been working on the Cognitive Abilities Test, COGATS, probably about 15 years since before I had my PhD. So it's something that has been part of my research and my practice all along. And so I'm, I'm really excited to talk about the ways that we use that data and how it can help schools. Great. Thanks. Um, and my name is Anna Hoffman. So I work directly with Riverside Insights, um, which is the uh, the vendor that, that distributes and, and supports educators with the cognitive abilities assessment. Um, and I lead some of the product development and marketing initiatives at Riverside for COGAT. 
Um, previously, I was an elementary and middle school teacher in New Jersey and New York, and then was an assessment coordinator for a number of years and assessment director. Um, so have, you know, a, a number, a bit of experience with how to actually use the data in the classroom. Um, and so right now in my current role, I get to work with districts across the country to help them kind of better utilize this, the assessment data in the classroom to really drive student growth. Yeah, yeah. That sounds great. Yeah, I love having both of you here and bringing those different but complementary perspectives. I'm excited for our conversation and personally excited because I have kids who are right in this zone. You know, I have a fourth and a fifth <laughs> grader. So we've had some COGAT discussions in our home over the last couple of years. And uh, it's nice to, you know, be talking with y'all, kind of go direct to the source you know, for <laughs> some of this info that we were looking at. But I will start as I always start, which is asking the question why this is important to you out of all the things that you could focus on in our field. Why this in particular? Joni, I'll let you go first. Yeah. Uh, so I've always been really interested in how we plan instruction to help students maximize their potential. So, you know, some of the applications we'll talk about is gifted education, but I'm interested across the spectrum of how do we identify students' strengths and help them to develop that? So working with tests, working with assessment data, to me, is a really great way of informing instruction, of differentiating instruction. So I'm always excited to talk to practitioners about kind of some of the myths or misunderstandings of ability testing um, and kind of helping them to see the, the value of those tools. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Anna, how about you? Yeah, so this topic has been really personal to me, honestly, since I was a little girl. Um, many members of my family learn and think very differently. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I remember as a kid not really understanding why they were struggling in school and why they hated school. Um, and then I decided, you know, at the age of 14, that education was what I wanted to commit my life to, that I wanted to help kids um, really figure out their true potential because I saw my siblings and members of my family that just really struggled with that. So I became a teacher. And when I was teaching um, in some really low income areas, um, all of our focus was on getting our kids to pass the state test and on getting them to close that achievement gap. Um, and so what we would do is stop instruction in January and then test prep from January through May. And what we saw over time is that Kindergarten, they were doing really well. First grade, they were doing really well. Second grade, they were doing really well. Fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, they were not doing well. As the content got harder, as the content got more rigorous, as they were forced to critically think and problem solve, they struggled. And then they got to college and they failed out. And it was because when I look back in hindsight, um, all of our kids were just focused on re re retaining and regurgitating skills that we were teaching in the classroom and not really learning how to be a thinker. And not really learning who they were as a, as a student or as a, you know, what their strengths were. And so um, what is so cool about the work we're doing with COGAT is that we're actually trying to flip the script on how we teach students. That it's so much less about retaining and regurgitating knowledge and so much more about how a student thinks, um, how they problem solve, helping them be confident as a learner, and then long term, like how that leads to their own personal growth and success. Um, so it is, it is super cool I, what we're doing. And I think it is, you know, especially post COVID, a really great opportunity to redefine what instruction looks like in the classroom and how to really support both cognitive growth, but then also, you know, individual understanding and growth as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I feel like people are maybe doing a little bit of a reset now, or at least we're putting more of a microscope onto student learning uh, following COVID. Mm -hmm. So it is good timing to think about a different approach. It's interesting to me to hear you say that component about um, stopping instruction in January and teaching to the test. I, you always heard that, or I always heard that over the years. And to know that it's true is, you know, sad and validating. Right? Yeah. And it was unfortunate because I think, you know, our learners that, like I said, I was teaching in a very low income area um, and all we were trying to do was close the achievement gap for kids. But yeah. in, in hindsight, what I didn't realize is the way we were trying to close the achievement gap was getting them to pass an end of year state test. And we weren't really helping them understand who they were as thinkers and learners and um, teaching them the critical thinking and problem solving skills that were going to actually help them be successful for life. Um, like beyond that state test at the end of the year. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. And that's that's a big issue in testing more generally. You know, I, I like to talk about these bumper sticker ideas, and one of them is having a test worth teaching to. And, you know, mm. my whole career in, in testing, we've talked about that. I don't think that the state test have ever become that for a variety of reasons. But that's one thing to think about is, you know, if our states could move to better assessments that were measuring more accurately these critical thinking skills, complex problem solving, there's a lot of problems with that. But, um, yeah, to the extent that we keep going back to these sort of basic proficiency measures, we're not getting to that point where there would be a test worth prepping for because it measured important skills in authentic ways. Mm, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I know we're already <laughs> sort of getting off topic a little bit, but I think this is important, or at least off script. So the this is interesting. Like we talk a lot in my house, or like I said, I have a fourth and a fifth grader who one of them is very keyed into test performance. Um, and so we talk a lot about, you know, or he talks a lot about how he did on, you know, the star, whatever star tests or the maps or, you know, the, the, you know, there's all these. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in your mind, are there uh, in our current educational system, are there tests that are quote unquote better than others in terms of like measure, you know, gauging these critical thinking, these skills that you deem more important? It's it's always hard to say because each state no, Yeah. Maps and, um, Star, there's a couple of other products that are kind of um, permeating different states. Mm-hmm. So there's some consistency, but a lot of states have their own systems. Like uh, yeah. my state of Alabama keeps throwing out their test and, and reinventing it over and over. And each time it's not any better than the previous. So um, <laughs> yeah. I think sometimes these these national programs like like MAP and some of these other, you know, that are shared across states probably are going closer to that value just because every time you start over, you're kind of people sort of reinventing the wheel. So I I do like to see, you know, we had smarter balance and we had park, you know, with the common core assessments and they're sort of, the wheels are kind of falling off those carts. Um, But Mm. those were an attempt to make a test worth teaching to. So yeah, so some of them are more valid, especially if they have like, um, you know, computer adaptive and they're able to tailor student skills so they don't have that problem of just measuring like basic and below basic proficiency levels i think those Mm -hmm. are better assessments okay yeah that's fair fair. oh sorry jeremy go ahead no you're Um, good go for it i i do think it's important kind of on on the back end of that question to understand when you're looking at comparing assessments to understand what they're measuring Mm. um i think that a lot of, you know, the state tests and MAP and STAR and all of those tests, they're what we call achievement tests. So mm-hmm. they're measuring predominantly what you're learning on a day-to-day basis in the classroom. Like they're measuring knowledge, if you will, like, how, you know, and that if you look at in a simplistic way, like if you look at the brain, like that's kind of the back part of the brain. Like what are you, re- what information are you retaining? Whereas the, an ability test like the COGAT is more measuring um, problem solving skills and critical thinking skills. And um, are you able to take new information and apply it to a different scenario? So it's less about what you're learning on a day-to-day basis. And it's more about how does your brain think? Like, and that's more of kind of the frontal lobe piece of your brain. Um, so I think it's important as we compare tests and think about the different, like the testing industry as a whole, that, we're, that we really understand what these tests are measuring um, and what they're telling us about students. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. And hopefully through this conversation, we can delineate some of that a little more clearly for folks who may want it or be interested in it. It might be a nice segue to talk more about the COGAT and what exactly it is. I know that I hear a lot about it just as a pediatric psychologist, you know, doing a lot of testing with kids and of course having my own kids. And it's still a little bit of a mystery, uh, basically, you know, for my own. Uh, lack of research into it. And I'm guessing there are other practitioners who are probably in the same, same boat. So yeah, let's tackle that. What, uh, tell us what is the COGAT exactly? Perfect. Um, great segue. So the COGAT is an assessment that measures student or, you know, anyone cognitive ability. Um, so like we were just talking about, if you think about the, the typical standardized test that a student takes in the classroom, even the SATs and AP tests and ACTs, those are measuring achievement. So it's measuring what a student has learned. The COGAT, on the other hand, on the other end of the spectrum, is measuring how a student learns. 
So it actually looks at a student's cognitive reasoning ability, verbal reasoning, quantitative reasoning, nonverbal and figural reasoning, how a student thinks about different types of problems, how a student takes new information and applies that to um, a, a new scenario. Um, so it is instead of helping, like um, having a student, you know, re regurgitate skills or standards or show mastery of knowledge, it's really looking at more how a student thinks um, and, and, and how a student applies that thinking to an entirely different situation. Um, so it is, um, we typically, the COGAT, typically the full, the full battery has three different parts. There's a quantitative reasoning section, a verbal reasoning section, and a nonverbal figural reasoning section. Um, and students can take it kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. A lot of districts across the country use it as part of their gifted and talented or advanced academic identification processes. Um, but we're seeing more and more districts start to shift and actually use it for students in the classroom to, to develop talent, to develop, um, you know, cognitive ability and to really push students to a higher level of critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But look, keep me honest on that and definitely jump in <laughs> if there, there was anything else you'd add. So I think one thing your, your audience will wonder, so this is a group administered ability test. Um, and so it does have a pretty high correlation with things like the composite from the Woodcock Johnson and some of the more IQ focused measures. Uh, but the, the big focus is finally in an audience where I can say fluid intelligence and they'll know what I mean. Right? Yes. <laughs> is that fluid intelligence, the reasoning component um, of human ability. And we measure it using the three different domains of verbal, quantitative and figural reasoning. Uh, and so the, the test was originally developed really to help inform instruction alongside achievement data. So helping you to, like Anna was saying, um, how do you, where do you learn the most easily, the quickest? Where do you have the more capacity for more complex thinking? And so those three different domains are really important uh, to assess the different areas of reasoning because they align with different aspects of, of education. So we do find that students with stronger verbal skills relative to the quantitative have a different experience across the curriculum than students with other profiles. So um, that's another important thing that the we use those three battery scores to influence that kind of understanding of the students relative strengths and weaknesses in learning. Yeah. Yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong. I hope you will. Would, does it make any sense to conceptualize it as basically a, a more expanded version of the fluid reasoning index on the WISC say, like, are the, is, is it all kind of, tapping into fluid reasoning or are we maybe drawing, I'm just trying to draw a yeah. comparison between what I'm super familiar with. So are we more looking at like verbal versus visual and fluid reasoning or is it sort of an expansion of fluid reasoning or? Yeah, it's sort of combined. So if you think about like, yeah, the verbal and the performance scores from an IQ test um, and then sort of a fluid reasoning score, the the verbal battery of COGAT would correlate with both that verbal component and the, the reasoning component. Um, so there is some sort of different differentiation there. Um, a big difference is that we try we're not trying to get into the processes. So all those additional working memory, um, processing speed, things like that, we're not tapping into that. That's sort of you know something that's better assessed in a one on one environment. So we're really looking broadly at that verbal and the performance component, but also the the figural component. Uh, sorry, the the fluid component. Sure, sure. So and all of the above is what I just said. <laughs> great, great. That sounds good. Yeah, no, that does help me organize it. Actually, I, you know, I have to, I have to classify things and make it familiar as much as possible. So okay. you said group administration. So does this mean kids are on laptops in the classroom? Is it all computer based or is there a mechanical component? Or what? So historically, it was, it was paper based and, you know, slowly over time, people are moving the online administration um, is fully comparable. So we do um, concordance studies where we show where we can adjust for any differences and how difficult it is paper-based or online. Um, I know a lot of testing programs have had to do that kind of on the fly during COVID when they suddenly mm. started administering <laughs> virtually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's something that we already had built in because it, it has been kind of a transition and, and some schools really stick it out with the paper-based, but once they see how easy the, the online administration is, it's much more User friendly, um, so yeah, it's computer based. They can use different kinds of tablets. Uh, so we do try to use the the technology that students are most familiar with, right? That that increases the access for the test. Of course, of course. 
That's great. That's great. Uh, yeah, I, there may be more questions to ask. I'll, we'll see where we go, you know, as far as the relationship to more standard IQ tests. Um, but I'll hold off on those for now because I know we have some other exciting material to get into. I will say this. So as far as what the scores look like, can you just do a, a sort of a brief description? Like, are we talking about uh, standard scores or something else? Like, how, what does the scoring look like and how can we interpret the results? So the the test is reported on a couple of different scales. One is uh, a universal scale score, which goes across the different levels. So Anna mentioned it goes from K to 12. So there's a, a level for five and six-year-olds up through 17, 18. Uh, and so that scale is the vertical scale that connects all the different levels you can compare over time. Uh, but then within each uh, age or grade level, we have the standard age score scale, which we call an IQ-like scale. Uh, so it's mean of 100, standard deviation of 16, not 15. Mm, <laughs> that's interesting. Why? Okay. Because we felt like it. Um, so it's just slightly <laughs> the traditional IQ Thanks. scale, but very, yeah. very similarly interpreted. Um, and so, yeah, we try to call it IQ like because we don't want folks to think it's completely interchangeable with, uh, you know, Woodcock Johnson score, um, primarily because we just don't measure those process skills. So if you're thinking about some of the clinical diagnostic uses, it should not be used as an, an interchangeable measure. But if you're interested in ability and how it predicts future learning, then it is very comparable. And that's why we use that scale that's so familiar. Uh, but we also report things like national percentiles. And a lot of schools use local percentile scores, which is a growing area of interest and use, especially related to the gifted identification. Yeah. Uh, yeah we have the, the verbal, the quantity of the nonverbal. They get their own scales as well as composite. And uh, what's helpful is that there are some sort of meta composites like uh, the QM composite is the best predictor of science and math outcomes. So not just quant by itself, but quant combined with figural is a better predictor. So you can kind of mix and match the three batteries. And then we have the ability profile, which is more about the that relative, uh, what's it called on the, on the, the WISP with the jagged, um, the profile score kind of thing. Um, we have a system of that that relates those different relative performance on VQN to specific instructional recommendations. Gotcha. So we find value in all the different combinations. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. And it's, uh, I know I'm asking some dumb questions, but hopefully some other individuals out there taking benefit from this, but what's the like theoretical framework? I mean, is a like CHC derived measure Absolutely. or is there something yeah. different? Yeah. 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 So, you know, initially, so the first version of this test was called the Lorch Thorndike and came out in like 1950 something. Um, so obviously they were probably more influenced by uh, Spearman and, and some earlier theorists, but, um, but yes, it's absolutely designed around the CHC. So when you look at the cattell carroll model and you look at fluid reasoning, it actually has three components that are sequ sequential quantitative reasoning and then maybe inductive reasoning. And we find that those map pretty well onto the EQN. So we use the different terms. I don't think anyone would be excited to take the inductive reasoning test. But if we call it figural reasoning, they're like, okay. Uh, so <laughs> it does map well onto the way that that uh, John Carroll organized fluid reasoning in that way. Great, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for bearing with some of these <laughs> basic. <laughs> so questions. I'll say that um, Riverside also publishes the Woodcock Johnson and mm -hmm. Kevin McGrew, who's like the, I would say the sort of grandfather or the the current caretaker of CHC theory. He's part sure. of the, the Riverside team, so. I don't know him personally, but I love to be in any way connected to him and his work. So, yeah, yeah, he's done great. I'll work. name drop him here. <laughs> love that, love that. Totally okay. Yeah, well, thanks for doing some some intro. Um, I'm I am really excited to get into some of the more applied components of the COGAD. And so, you mentioned that it's primarily used, or maybe that's my word, for GT assessment. Is that fair? I mean, is that an accurate statement at this point? Yeah, I think, I think, and, and Joni, keep me honest on this, but I think that even though COGAT was identified or created as, a, as an assessment to really be used in conjunction with achievement data to support student learning, over time, um, specifically like as state assessments have taken, you know, has become more dominant um, with mm -hmm. some of the federal policies that, that have been enacted over the past decade or so. Um, there has been a need for additional assessments to be used in states that have gifted and talented identification processes. And so 
Um, COGAT has become, because it is considered, you know, an assessment that, that really assesses like how students understand, how students think and, and students capacity for learning, um, it has become used um, very often as, as part of the gifted and talented identification process. So um, we see many districts that have migrated to using COGAT for universal screening. Um, if they are identifying for gifted and talented, frequently in like second or third grade. Um, and then there are some districts that are still using it, you know, on a referral based, uh, as a, like through an referral based approach for gifted and talented. Although from an equity standpoint, we, we highly recommend doing universal screening as opposed to just referring students for gifted and talented identification. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that is where we've seen kind of the, the COGAT administration shift. Um, what we are starting to see is that as districts really understand the value of the information that they're getting, there are many districts that are that are using it for far more than just gifted identification now. Um, they are they're seeing that it's actually impacting how students can learn in the classroom. Um, and so we are starting to work with districts across the country that are that are trying to utilize the, the data and the information for more than just gifted and gifted and talented identification and trying to expand their stories so that so that they can kind of impact other districts and, and that folks can start to see the value of how to use this in the classroom. Yeah. Yeah, I'll say that the if you look at among schools that use tests, right, COGAT's the the market leader, they would say. So we get a lot of schools, if they if they do gift identification with tests like this, a lot of them do use COGAT. But again, that wasn't the original purpose. And, you know, what Anna was saying about the, the rise of, you know, accountability testing, um, that might be part of it because ability tests used to have a more prominent role that, um, you know, originally COGAT was kind of administered alongside the Iowa test, uh, which used to be called the Iowa test of basic skills. And a lot of folks, you know, I know the state of Georgia used to use both of those together. And, and so it was used for instructional planning uh, and then sort of since they were already familiar with it, they used it for things like gifted identification. Uh, but over time, I think ability testing has really become just the purview of special education testing, kind of the identifying of, of learning disabilities or learning needs. And so it's sort of like ability testing is only for the two tails of the distribution. Uh, and so that's, you know, I think it's unfortunate because we get so much information. And now that we have universal screening where schools are administering something like COGAT to their entire second grade classroom, to me, it's a shame to throw out 80, 90% of what you just collected um, and not use that. So, you know, I had friends in, in grad school who had been teachers and they would say, oh yeah, we got our COGAT scores. Uh, and then I put it in a drawer. <laughs> and that was it. They never used it. Awesome. Uh, or they're like, that's what the, yeah, <laughs> that's what the gifted person does. And no one else in the whole school ever looks at COGAT scores. Uh, and to me, that's just, a huge waste of the time and the money and everything that goes into to the ability testing. So, you know, while it's really, really important to do universal screening, so every student has an opportunity to demonstrate need, whether it's for special education services or gifted education or a combination, um, that, you know, that huge swath in the middle, there's so much value. And, you know, I think that's part of why it's hard to kind of get general ed class classroom teachers bought in is because it doesn't help them. And so they're like, why should I spend my time giving something like the COGAT when I already do the achievement test? You know, what, what is this adding? And so that's kind of my personal mission is to make sure that teachers are more aware of what can be, you know, what are the implications of COGAT scores and why should they, you know, ask their gifted specialist to, to give them the classroom reports, you know, that they, they could be using. Yeah. 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 I also think there's a, a misnomer about that. Um, there's a misunderstanding about what ability data is and people who are not familiar with ability assessments and ability data hear the word ability data and frequently connect it to IQ tests. And I think that because of how IQ tests were misused and um, just to be really blunt, like the unequitable practices that arose out of it, I think that there's a lot of fear about using an ability assessment in a similar way. Um, and what we're trying to demonstrate is that, number one, an ability assessment is not a direct comparison to an IQ test. And number two, we're actually promoting equitable practices to unlock doors for students that wouldn't necessarily be unlocked through just typical achievement testing. Um, so 
Um, but but we are having to, you know, try and flip the story on its head about what ability tests can be used for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's I want to I want to dig into some of that. You know, Joni, you uh, phrased the question as sort of like you know people ask, what's the point of doing universal screening, basically, or like you know what's the point of administering to all these kids? I, how would you answer that question? Just right off the bat, like, what are the benefits? So one of the benefits from the gifted education perspective is that there will be students who have talents for academic areas who are not noticed if if you're basing it on what teachers see in the classroom or what they see from achievement data. Um, So, you know, a lot of gifted students have high ability and do well in the classroom. So their achievement scores will be high. Those, Those are the best case scenario. But then there's this other pool of students who maybe act out or they're disengaged. They don't like school or they've become, you know, kind of disenfranchised by the classroom. Uh, And those are exactly the students who achievement scores might not be high. Their relationship with the teacher might not be great. uh, And so they don't have that opportunity to have that talent recognized and maybe be put in a situation that'd be better for their talent. So, you know, just from an equity perspective, like, there are some hidden gems out there. And so having multiple measures like ability to test alongside achievement can help you uncover those students. Um, But then from a broader perspective of what's the value case for ability scores, it's really about planning instruction. So if you have information about a a student's current achievement level and you have information about their abilities, um, you might be able to do something like, you know, small groups and flexible ability grouping where you say, okay, these are students who, uh, haven't mastered the skill, but they are going to learn very quickly. They can be put in maybe a more independent situation or a small group that's ready to go quickly versus another student who is not meeting an achievement goal, but is also going to learn slower in that domain. They may need more structure and support to achieve those goals. So we know that if you have relatively weak quantitative scores, um, the big risk there is that you'll develop math anxiety, which I think is kind of a endemic in our society. <laughs> the sort of sense I'm not a math person. And so a low quant score does not mean you're not a math person. It does mean that math will come more slowly or it may not be as natural to you. And so you might need more time studying it, more opportunities to sort of you know use manipulatives, use different kinds of learning, ta- um, learning engagement styles, um, just different kinds of instruction. And so the two pieces combined help you to make those decisions as a teacher. So that's really the value proposition um, for testing everybody with ability test. And it, I just, yeah, I hope that, you know, in another 10 years, gifted ed is just one thing, you know, that they happen to use the COGAS scores for that, as well as planning instruction. And so, yeah, that's really my focus is, is broadening that, like Anna was saying, kind of changing the story about ability test, and then making sure that people aren't just using it for one purpose, especially if that one purpose is a cut score, and you classify the kid, and that's it end of identification. So that's kind of the worst case that is unfortunately the the reality in some districts right now. And, and I can give you a couple examples of what that looks like practically in the classroom. Um, um, one, you know, two kiddos immediately popped to mind that were in my fifth grade class. They were both African-American boys. They were held back numerous years in a row because of their state achievement scores. Um, yet they were extremely extraordinarily talented in different ways. Um, one of them loved to read and love science. And in, when looking back, I had a hunch that he was much more capable than his achievement scores were demonstrating. Um, I had no way to prove that. Another one of my kiddos that was held back because of his achievement scores um, drew everything out on paper. When he, he made stories, he made pictures, he made buildings. This was clearly a nonverbal or figural learner that was really strong at spatial understanding. And if I had known that he had a strength in nonverbal reasoning, I would have taught him math completely differently. I would have pulled out the manipulatives. I would have had him draw out pictures on his on his on his um, on his chart or on his page. I would have given him extra time for his assessments so that he could create that mental model that he needed to create to solve the problem. But we didn't have any of that information. Um, and so it would have completely changed my way of instruction if I had known that that first little boy was a verbal learner and the second little boy was a 
was a non was a nonverbal like figural learner. Um, and then I could have really differentiated an instruction to the way that those students learned best in the classroom. And who knows, like they may not have they, they may have done much better on some, you know, achievement assessments when they had instruction that was actually aligned to the way that they thought. Right. Yeah, those are great examples. Those are great examples. I wonder if I could maybe have you clarify a little bit and and maybe it's just we're just getting wrapped up in um, semantic differences. We'll see. But, you know, thinking about when you talk about like these different sort of learning styles and or learning differences, how do you kind of reconcile that or explain that in the context of the, you know, the research that is kind of like the kind of says that's not a necessarily a distinction we can make you know do you see what i'm saying like learning styles like that's kind of a myth i was about to interrupt and say that learning styles are not a thing um it is very complex to talk about it so um ability tests especially the way that we do it also gets into that sort of specific abilities and i know that that is a huge um debate when you look at um school psychology especially like whether or not those battery scores are meaningful in the context or is it just (laughs) General ability. Is it all general ability and you're foolish? Oh my to gosh. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I, I read these things. And so there's a lot of data that if you're looking at a really broad level, you're just saying like, oh, spe- specific abilities don't matter. It's just general ability. That's, it's, you know, you don't need those other scores. Sure. But when you look at, so I think about it like, you know, talent development, or I like to think about it almost in terms of career development um, with the idea that career development is a, you know, process throughout childhood. I'm not just talking about high school kids, but when you think about kind of the career trajectory or the expertise trajectory of students, um, you know, general ability is a really powerful predictor for general outcomes. So if you want to know if a student's probably going to do well in school, um, you know, that general ability, that composite score from COGA, something like that will be useful. Um, But I'm really interested in if students are going to have a particular talent for engineering science? Are they going to have a particular skill in the language arts? So understanding where they might develop expertise and where they could be most successful, like, you know, learning the quickest, being most comfortable with learning, pushing the boundaries of our knowledge, right? Like pursuing education, formal or informal, um, all of that can be better predicted from those specific abilities. So even though they aren't as powerful a predictor as general ability in some of those cases, you can't predict specific areas of talent, of future talent development using general ability, right? It just tells you they're, they've got it or they don't have it versus ability profiles tells you more about where strengths might be. So I do disagree with some of that, that literature on whether profiles are ever useful. Um, and I think they're incredibly useful when understanding individual talent trajectories. Now, getting back to learning styles. So traditionally, so learning styles is the theory that there are certain ways that you learn better and you should be taught in a way that matches that ability. So um, if you're a spatial learner, I should only show you pictures. I shouldn't show you words. The nuance is that you actually want to support them in, in incongruent ways, I guess that's a way of putting it. So, um, you know, so like Anna's story about the, the student who was very visual, they can come up with that visual model and that can be very effective for them. But the difference is that we also want to support them. And this is what Anna was getting at was you want to support them with those skills they have in learning math in traditional formats too. So when I'm being dismissive of learning styles, I say, you know, you can't dance a math equation. Well, you can, (laughs) but I don't think it's very, (laughs) it's not a very effective way over time. Like you can't continue to be engaged and excel in mathematics if you can't engage with formal mathematics. So the idea is more about understanding what kinds of learning come easier and using that to achieve a common outcome. So, you know, when I talk about like tailoring to students quantitative weakness, we're never going to say like, oh, you're not a math person. You don't need to know math. We're going to say, okay, what skills do you have and how are we going to leverage that to help you succeed in mathematics? So it's it's it sounds similar to learning styles, but it's sort of the opposite that we're not going to give you the thing that already comes easily to you. Spatially gifted kids don't need a lot of visuals. They can use visuals. They can come up with their own visuals. We need to support them with the words and understanding text. So it's, it's, it's subtle, but I do think there is strong support for, I know there's strong support for differentiation, but I think that that use case for ability test is valid and we have evidence for it. 
Whereas learning styles and the idea of like, I'm going to teach you how you learn, that is not supported by the literature. Joni, would you almost kind of talk about it as it, it unlocks a strategy for a student to apply to a new concept? So if a student is a spatial, like really prefers to reason spatially, that student could then apply that strategy to new information or a new, t- like a new concept. Would, I think so. And I also see that, especially with spatial, most, a lot of teachers don't realize that that's an area of strength for some students. So that's another area of development where uh, I'm working on a spatial reasoning test to help to differentiate that from just abstract reasoning. Uh, And I think it's really important because these kids don't know that that's an asset. And teachers especially may not know that that could be a deficit for other students, right? So that if you can't visualize, if you can't understand a graphical representation, that inhibits your learning as well. So I think there's some, um, it's kind of um, reaffirming to those students to say, that's an important skill, and you bring it to the classroom, and we're going to help others to also build up that skill. And that can maybe make you feel, yeah, you've got kind of a secret power that you didn't know was important. Um, But now you you do. And so it is a strategy for you to use in your learning. But Basically, the the antidote to all the learning styles thing is is multimedia, right? Provide, don't provide just in the format that student prefers, but to provide in all formats, multimedia uh, options, different ways of engaging in the content, um, you know, that is valuable for all students. They can kind of pick and choose what works for them in learning a specific thing. Um, So similarly to what Anna's saying, like providing different strategies and different ways of engaging content can also be valuable. I appreciate you diving into that and making some of those fine distinctions. Like I said, I think, yeah, there's a lot of maybe semantics going on and just getting the words right. But yeah, that totally, that makes sense. That makes sense. And I appreciate the the deep dive and indulging, indulging the questions here. Yeah. I, you did say something that's interesting to me that we might detour for just a second with the spatial reasoning component. Um, Mm-hmm. And like you said, it can be a little bit of a, a secret superpower. Um, I, how else does that show up in day-to-day classroom work? Can you think of any examples of that where a kid with spatial reasoning could really excel that we might not think of? Let's take a break to hear from our featured partner. Conduct a broad-based assessment of personality and psychopathology with the Gold Standard Personality Assessment Inventory, or PAI. 22 non-overlapping scales cover a full range of clinical constructs, so you'll get the information you need to make a diagnosis and formulate a treatment plan. Plus, for your clients who speak Spanish, the new PAI Spanish revised translation retains semantic equivalence while updating language to be clearer and more inclusive. Learn more at parinc.com backslash PAI. All right, let's get back to the podcast. So. Well, my immediate thought is one place where it can hamper students that we didn't realize until recently was early mathematics. So if you think about like number line and being able to visualize numbers and understand why negative numbers are on that same continuum, Mm -hmm. that's a spatial representation. And so one thing that early education, early childhood folks are learning is that you have to build up spatial thinking skills for those early mathematics um, concepts. So you might find if a student has stronger spatial skills that they're just kind of naturally, you know, they'll figure out some things related to mathematics in those early years. Um, Because the obvious thing is you think about, oh, they're going to be really good at geometry. Sure. (laughs) There's lots of shapes and relationships there. Uh, But also, uh, even in those early math skills, it's sort of insidious how it influences early math learning and conceptualization. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, um, you know, a lot of folks will tell me, oh, my kid's very spatially gifted. They love Minecraft. And we did a study this summer. Like, it is true. You probably know this with kids. Literally every kid plays Minecraft. They just love oh, or gosh. Roblox you know, or some sure. combination. They like games within yeah. the games. I don't have kids, so I don't have any idea what, what the games within games are, but I respect it. Um, and you so don't want to open looking, that box. It's, it's a deep box. I've tried. Box. Yeah. I can't get it. <laughs> <laughs> One of those things you have to you have to hit at a certain age, um, kind of like Ewoks. If you were young enough to love Ewoks, then you love Ewoks. I wasn't the right age to learn uh, Minecraft, so I'll, I don't think I'll ever understand it. That's fair. But the way kids engage with it can be really different. So if you're like my nephew once showed me how you could like use the blocks to like build a 
pit and then someone would fall into it and you could cover them up. That is not very spatially <laughs> loaded. But when he builds like castles or he builds, you know, mazes and interactive spaces, that's a very spatial, a spatially loaded task. So if you're going in and you're doing things involving building or problem solving with spatial relationships, so it might be a maze, it might be um, even navigating that space, you know, in a video game, that can be a sign of, of spatial strengths. Versus if you're going in and you're playing games that are more like, you know, interactions, they're more like um, kind of reasoning, problem solving, maybe, maybe you're playing some kind of like, um, you know, I'm thinking like for grown ups, we play like solitaire, we play Candy Crush. If it's something that looks more like that, it's not really spatially loaded, even if it might also occur within the Minecraft universe. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing is kind of thinking about the ways they engage with the same content in a more spatially nuanced way. Mm -hmm. Um, and as grown-ups, obviously, spatial reasoning is really important to engineering, geosciences. There's a huge mm -hmm. field of, you know, geospatial information sciences is growing, and that is spatially loaded. So there's a lot of careers that require spatial reasoning skills. Mm, yeah, that's so true. Mm -hmm. It's been interesting to see, you know, my kids both go to the same school and they teach math the same way. And so my son went through it last year, and now my daughter is going through it. And to see the differences there in the way that they use spatial representation in math. And, you know, like one of my kids really, really gets it. And when they explain it, it makes sense. But one of my others doesn't so much. And um, it's really, I don't know, it's just a, an interesting example of uh, yeah, how that, I'm sure that, that scales is, to other yeah. kids in the class. Well, yeah. and, and, and in the past decade or so, we've completely done a 180 with how we teach math, even starting in the early, like early pre-K ages. I mean, I think the way that all of us learned multiplication, subtraction, addition, and division is really different than the way that kids are learning it now in the classroom. Um, and they're learning it from a much more like unpacking what the numbers actually mean, um, how you look at what does three look like when you draw it out, when you model it out, what does three plus four really mean from like a spatial perspective mm -hmm. of when you put it together. And so they're students are having to rely even from like pre-K on um, when they're being introduced to numbers, um, to, they're having to rely on some spatial, you know, skills and competencies that that historically you didn't have to necessarily lean as heavily on when you were learning math. It's so true. Yeah. The model that they do at my kids' school is that the kids actually don't do the homework. They have to teach the grown up how to do the homework. And so... <laughs> you know, my kids are teaching me and I'm like learning these spatial representations on the fly and having to somehow do math that way. You know, it's been, yeah. it's been a cool process, but yeah, you're, it's, 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 Sometimes I think it's good. Yeah. When I see com people complaining about it on social media, a lot of times it's, you know, some of those heuristics, like shortcut ways of doing math. And they're like, why should I learn how to guesstimate? Why should I learn how to, you know, I've seen some kind of web thing that lets you do multiplication, you know, with paper representations. And, you know, part of that is that other people were having to invent that on their own, right, to kind of work out some of these problems. So, yeah, if you're really comfortable with math, you figure out ways of guesstimating, right? Like, I'm comfortable with math. And so when I cook and I need to do like two thirds, I have sort of heuristics of how I do that. Uh, and basically what they're doing is trying to take those heuristics and teach them to people, uh, which is very kind of an odd thing to do, but it just, instead of waiting for kids to maybe come up with these sort of ways of thinking, they're trying to expose them to a lot of different ways of being comfortable with math and with numbers and, and concepts like proportion. So, um, you know, whether or not every kid should have to learn how to do, you know, the math in each of these different ways, I'm not sure that it really makes a lot of sense, but presenting all these different ways is really valuable because then it gives kids other ways of, of thinking with numbers. And that's the kind of reasoning, you know, being comfortable with quantity and with relative amounts and being flexible with quantitative concepts, right? That's exactly what makes reasoning, you know, something unique from achievement, right? Knowing your math facts, knowing how to solve problems in traditional classic ways. Uh, and so it, it is interesting to see them kind of complicate math to make it more engaging to some students, but it definitely is pretty messy looking if you don't know what they're doing and why they're doing it. <laughs> true. True. I've explained it to my mother many times when she works with her grandkids and she still, <laughs> still does not understand. <laughs> I can understand. Yeah. <laughs> 
Let's talk about some more applications. I, I mean, I really like this idea. We we definitely detoured, which was fun. And this idea that screening students is a great way to uh, sort of level the playing field and do away with some of those uh, issues with inequity and, uh, yeah, like kids who might otherwise be passed over or even uh, thrown into special ed, you know, like we know the research says that kids of color and marginalized kiddos are thrown into special ed or whatever, diagnosed with behavioral issues at a lot higher rate than non-marginalized kids. Right. And so I would love to hear any more of those applications or, you know, ways that, that y'all are finding this can be super helpful for, for those kinds of kiddos. Yeah, absolutely. So we're seeing some districts across the country do some really innovative work using their CODA data. Um, one in particular, a, a big, a big, pretty diverse district, what they are doing is um, testing grades one, three, five, seven, and nine using this ability or testing every child in those grades with COGAT and then comparing their COGAT data to their achievement data and using that comparison to identify if there are any extreme outliers. Who are the students that are super that are relatively high high ability and are not performing on an achievement test? And that's a that's an indication to them that something else might be going on with that student. Perhaps there is a learning difference with that student. Perhaps there's a social emotional issue with that student. Perhaps that student we see you know often maybe that student's an English language learner and would potentially you know frequently be diagnosed with a learning disability, but actually is a strong verbal reasoner just doesn't know English. Um, so that's, that's a common use case for it. So even using kind of the ability alongside achievement to identify gaps and potential and performance for students has been a really powerful use case of, of the COGAT. The other one that we're seeing that is also very powerful is um, in, in um, using COGAT and using the ability data uh, to support talent development with students. So um, we work with one district that has created this program where they actually take the ability data and give it to students and, and teach students like you are you are strong in quantitative reasoning. And then they have enrichment time throughout the day where that student then actually goes and develops that talent through activities and resources that are, you know, supposed that are that are research designed to, to develop that quality, quantitative reasoning even more. And then they have days where that student is then going and developing their areas that are not as strong, like verbal reasoning or figural reasoning. Um, and so what's really cool about watching this play out in action, we actually got to zoom in and see the kids engaging in these activities the other day is that they're able to tell you like, I'm really strong at verbal reasoning. This is my strength. I am not as strong at quantitative reasoning. This is an area I'm working to develop. And these kids that are eight, nine, 10 years old are able to articulate that in a way that, you know, I had to hire a joke. I had to hire an executive coach in my 30s to understand what my, my my reasoning strengths were. But to have to see the impact of the talent development that that these that these schools are, are doing and to see the impact from a social emotional perspective that it's actually having on kids um, as they're able to understand their own strengths and their own relative weaknesses um, is, a, is just a really, really, really powerful use case of how, how districts are utilizing this information. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. You said a couple things that are super interesting to me. The first, going back to that first point you made, I don't know if it's too much of a reach, but it almost seems like you could use this COGAT versus achievement discrepancy as as a proxy for, yeah, maybe mental health concerns or social emotional concerns or environmental issues. Like to me, that would be really important. Like, why are you doing so well on the ability test and not so well on the academic, like I immediately, immediately I'm like, what is getting in the way here? Is this like not being able to do your homework at home? Is it um, being distracted in the classroom due to some, you know, ADHD or something? You know, I don't know if that's the direction people are headed, but that's one thing that that jumped up on my radar is just that could be that's a really valuable gap to notice and yeah. opens up a lot of possibilities for how to intervene with a student, maybe screen other things. Totally. And it doesn't necessarily give you the answer of why, right? Sure. Yeah. It definitely doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't give you that answer. But, you know, what it does show you is maybe a student doesn't have the tutoring resources that another student has. Maybe mm -hmm. a student 
doesn't have the books at home that another student has. Maybe a mm-hmm. student doesn't have a parent to help him or her with homework that another student has. Maybe a student does have something like maybe they just they're getting bullied at school and like that's why they're not performing. So it doesn't tell you why, mm-hmm. but it, it gives you the opportunity to ensure that you're not letting kids slip through the cracks because yeah. they're not achieving on those, you know, achievement benchmarks. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. It gives you an opportunity to ask more questions, basically. Yeah. And yeah mm-hmm. Be curious. That makes a lot of sense to me. And the other thing that you were saying, I just I love that idea of um, maybe combating some of that stereotype threat almost by sharing some of these results with kids. You know, I could see that being super helpful with like girls in STEM, for example, or minority kids across the board, you know, if, if you share that information and say like, Hey, you're really good at this. And then that starts to build and combat some of those internal messages that might get in the way that they may have learned elsewhere. I don't know. Again, maybe that's a reach, but that's no, it's it's always a danger, you know, because their, you know, growth mindset interventions Mm. may or may not be as effective as originally touted, but Uh we know that having a, fixed mindset, you know, an entity idea that I'm smart and that means I shouldn't have to work hard. Uh, I'm smart. It means I should be good at everything. Everything should come easily. And if it doesn't, then I'm secretly not smart. And it was all a mistake. Um, Mm. Regardless of what kind of that broader literature shows, we know that for students with academic talents, it's a real risk that knowing that they have strengths can make them think like, oh, I shouldn't have to make effort. So having that growth mindset, that sort of incremental idea that whether I'm good at this or not good at this, I have to work towards, you know, accomplishments and expertise is a really important skill set. So it it is always, um, if you're going to talk to students about their ability scores, frame it in sense of even the, you know, even the smartest, most brilliant person you've seen on TV studies hard and works hard for what they're able to talk about. So um, yeah, really fighting that idea that smart kids don't work hard is yeah really important. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, throwing that in there to make sure that we don't forget. And and that's that's what's really interesting that our district that does a lot of this talent development. Um, it came out of it was so interesting. It came out directly out of her um work with understanding growth mindset and seeing how kids that were very able would crumple with a new challenge. And then she saw that kids that weren't as able, thought that, or, or weren't, weren't, you know, necessarily as cognitively gifted would also just think they weren't smart. And so she created this process of talent development and she frames it as a way, it's so powerful. Um, she frames it as a way of, we all have relative strengths. We all have relative, you know, areas of growth. And we're going to spend some days developing our relative strengths. And we're going to spend some days developing our relative areas of growth. Um, and it's, you hear kids talk, you you could hear kids talking about it in a way that was so impactful like they they would go around saying like this is my relative strength and i'm practicing x y and z today this is the area that i need to you know continue fostering and get better at um so it was really cool how she took this relative strengths and weaknesses and morphed it through the lens of a growth mindset to really empower kids to understand um you know what they were naturally potentially more able more ready and to do, but, but continue to prompt them to work on those skills. I love that. I love that. Yeah. And maybe just living it, like I said, with my kids mm-hmm. and seeing them do different things academically. And yeah, this is, it's some of the most meaningful work that anybody can do, I think is empowering kids. Mm-hmm. Well, I know that we're, gosh, we're getting close time-wise. This time always flies by. And as we start to wrap up, I wonder, are there other areas, anything that we uh, didn't cover that was worth diving into here for a few minutes? Uh, if not, that's totally okay. I know there are many cans of worms we could open, <laughs> may choose not to this time around. But yeah, anything big to get on get on the radar as far as the COGAT? So one thing Anna mentioned a while back was, you know, about kind of perceptions of IQ and his historical misuses. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I agree with that, that conception conceptualization. Um, one thing I, I would want to say is that um, you know, we really talk about tests are a mirror to society. Um, and so inequities in education and access to quality education are reflected in our test. The tests don't cause those differences. So 
you know, I would encourage folks who are talking to, you know, parents or advocates who are trying to say all tests are, you know, out there to keep kids out. They're trying to, you know, perpetuate inequities. Um, you know, tests really, again, are, are a mirror. They reflect those inequities. So, you know, the reason that I believe in tests and I work in tests and I study how to make them better um, is because I think they help reflect those inequities and remind us of the work we need to do. Uh, so, mm. you know, if you think about, we're sort of reconceptualizing achievement gaps to educational debts. And I think that's really true that some students by you know, virtue of where they're born and the tax, you know, the tax policies of their school district and their families and, and their race and other backgrounds, those lead them to be in school, you know, educational systems that are lower quality, more stressed, less resourced, all these things. And so the tests are going to reflect that. Um, but if you get rid of the test, you don't get rid of the inequity. You just get rid of the ability to detect, detect it. Um, so, you know, that's, that's why, you know, I, I really believe in the value of assessment data cautiously interpreted. So I'm not trying to say like tests are perfect and uh, completely unbiased, but we do a lot of work to ensure that the content is equally accessible and meaningful to all students. Um, and we do a lot of work to ensure that the scores are comparable over time across students, different, you know, people will ask like, oh, if I take it on online, is it easier or harder? We've adjusted for that. We try to take those things into account. Um, and we know that the large test gaps that you might see really are, I, I think they're true. They're not a figment of the test. They're a reality of our system. And so um, I always want to blame the system and make the system better rather than focus on either the students being, you know, less than um, it's not the students and it's not the test. It's really the system. And so that's something I would want to just put out there on behalf of test. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> Standing up for the tests. Yes. So the la yeah, one of the few people is like, no, I, I think tests are really a force for good. I don't think, <laughs> I honestly don't think they're a force for evil. They're a force for good, um, but it, they do get a bad rap for some very good reasons. Right, right. Well, it seems clear that you're, you and other many others are working hard to reverse some of the, some of the problems that historically were present, right? So yeah, yes. test data could be the tool to address those. Yeah, if you know where the gaps are, if you know where students' strengths are, can you use that to address these inequities? Um and of course we need to fund our schools better and pay our teachers better. <laughs> I'll put it out there. <laughs> yes. I'm getting a political platform here. Yeah. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah. You can have the more money to the schools for those more statements. money to the teachers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, I'm totally in agreement with you on both of those things. So we can, maybe that's a nice note to end on. If, uh, if folks want to reach out to either of you, one, is that okay? And two, if so, what's the best way to find you? So I've given up on Twitter, but I still have a professional website and it's just my name, JoniLaken.com. Uh, so you can reach out to me via that. Yeah. Anna, how about you? Yeah, so um, we feel free to check out our website, riversideinsights.com, um, and then um, happy to take any, you know, personal emails, Anna.Houseman at riversideinsights.com. Great, great. I really appreciate y'all's time. Yeah, this is fun to to dig into a measure that I've been adjacent to for many, many years and probably should have had this conversation a long time ago, but I hope that it's been beneficial for folks. I know it was really interesting and compelling for me. So yeah, thanks for being here, both of you. Okay. Thanks for having us. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. Always grateful to have you here. I hope that you take away some information that you can implement in your practice and in your life. Any resources that we mentioned during the episode will be listed in the show notes. So make sure to check those out. If you like what you hear on the podcast, I would be so grateful if you left a review on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast. And if you're a practice owner or aspiring practice owner, I'd invite you to check out the Testing Psychologist Mastermind Groups. I have mastermind groups at every stage of practice development, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. We have homework, we have accountability, we have support, we have resources, these groups are amazing. We do a lot of work and a lot of connecting. 
If that sounds interesting to you, you can check out the details at thetestingpsychologist.com slash consulting. You can sign up for a pre-group phone call and we will chat and figure out if a group could be a good fit for you. Thanks so much. The information contained in this podcast and on the Testing Psychologist website are intended for informational and educational purposes only. Nothing in this podcast or on the website is intended to be a substitute for professional psychological, psychiatric, or medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Please note that no doctor-patient relationship is formed here, and similarly, no supervisory or consultative relationship is formed between the host or guests of this podcast and listeners of this podcast. If you need the qualified advice of any mental health practitioner or medical provider, please seek one in your area. Similarly, if you need supervision on clinical matters, please find a supervisor with an expertise that fits your needs.